Good evening, everyone. My name is Stephanie Bishke, and I am the event specialist at the Rutgers University Alumni Association. I thank you all for being with us today. Today, I'm pleased to welcome you to Healthcare Technology and Social Justice Converge, Applied Equity Research and Why It Matters to All of Us, led by Charles Santillo and moderated by Elizabeth Kalman. Charles is a health informatics researcher focused on improving chronic disease outcomes for underserved populations. His community-based research endeavors to address persistent healthcare disparities. His funded investigations of several chronic conditions include HIV, diabetes, hypertension, chronic kidney disease, and breast and prostate cancer. Charles has also led research projects across the country, including in Flint, Michigan, Dallas, Texas, and even right here in central New Jersey. He is an assistant professor at the Rutgers University School of Communication and Information in the Department of Library and Information Science. During the 2020 and 2021 academic year, he will be an MIT Martin Luther King Jr. visiting scholar. Elizabeth has been a nurse for over 20 years and is a proud alumna of Rutgers University. As a lifelong reproductive and sexual health advocate, she has become a leader in innovation and a dedicated nurse practitioner. Her passion is in research that leads to direct clinical impact and the implementation of best practices. In addition to her research, Elizabeth has published and produced clinical practice guidelines and continuing education programming, as well as served on various national and local boards. Currently, she serves as the Vice President for Research Development at Planned Parenthood of Northern, Central, and Southern New Jersey. As a lifelong learner, she gave her final Doctor of Nursing Practice project presentation this morning at Rutgers University and will graduate in October. If you have any questions for our presenters, please submit them in the Q&A box at the bottom right of your screen. We will do our best to accommodate as many questions as possible. For your convenience, this presentation is being recorded and will be uploaded to the Rutgers University YouTube channel. Following this presentation, you will receive an email with the link to the channel. It's now my pleasure to turn it over to Charles and Elizabeth. Thank you so much, Stephanie, for the wonderful introduction and thanks to the Rutgers Alumni Association for this opportunity. I'm looking forward to spending the next hour with you. Thank you for attending. Our title, as Stephanie indicated, is Healthcare Technology and Social Justice Converge applied equity research and why it matters to all of us. Again, as Stephanie indicated, I want to thank uh, our moderator, Elizabeth Talmont, and congratulations to her. She's had a full day, a full day today, and I uh, appreciate her spending this part of it with us. So Stephanie gave the introductions. As, I, as she mentioned, I am on faculty at the School of Communication and Information. I am a health informaticist. I focus on health equity work. And uh, Elizabeth is with Planned Parenthood, as well as a Rutgers, a proud Rutgers, a proud Rutgers alum. Just a few uh, agreements that we want to have before we start. This will be interactive. We do welcome questions, and we have a time slot allocated at the end for questions and answers, and we're looking forward to that. But just uh, some level setting points. Disagreement and difference is fine, as expected. That's okay, but let's share our space. We don't all evolve at the same pace, so let's keep that in mind. It's okay not to know certain things or not to be aware uh, of certain topics that we might bring up, at least during the presentation or, in fact, during the Q&A, and that's fine. We all start somewhere with our knowledge base, and hopefully that continues to expand. Uninformed does not equal inflammatory. Again, so we don't evolve at the same pace, but we'll try to minimize the latter, the inflammatory part. Use I statements when you're asking your questions. Speak from your perspective. Sit comfortably with silence. I like that one. It's okay to reflect. Silence is okay, especially when we're so stimulated by various electronic gadgets that are probably only a few inches from us right now. Your world is not the world. So your interpretation is not necessarily evidence, nor is it representative. So let's keep in mind that we have different perspectives. We embrace diversity, equity, and inclusion. And that means diverse points of view, and that's fine. As far as our goals go, or our agenda goes, I'll uh, start us off with some goals. 
I'll talk about how health equity is in fact a social justice issue, how HIT or health information technology can both promote health equity or hinder it. And I'll ask a question, does health equity really matter? This is meant to be provocative. I'll provide some context based on my experience in the field. General discussion and questions, and then closing remarks and next steps. So as Stephanie indicated, please submit your questions and we have people reviewing them. And at that space at the end, we will address the, the questions that you submit. Okay, goals. My goal for the uh, evening here is to kind of discuss our responsibility to actively consider equity in our work and in our lives. I submit that these issues touch us all at some point. Perhaps in current times, they may touch us more than at other times. So consider what is our responsibility? This is the Alumni Association event. We probably have people from all uh, different vocations, different uh, uh, sort of careers, different backgrounds, and that's good. But I'd like us to consider our responsibility collectively as citizens really to actively and intentionally consider equity in our walk in our work. I want to have us uh, have a common understanding of how technology can both promote equity and exacerbate inequity. We'll ponder the question, where do our responsibilities end? I'll focus a bit on an area that I do my research in, health information and technology. We'll use that as context for a couple of quick examples, happy to expand upon them during the Q&A, but clinical care delivery, the factors of information flow and needs at the point of care, that's just a term used for when you're actually interacting with a clinician, healthcare provider, with a particular emphasis on emerging technology. Data analytics, there are questions that arise from incorporating information that's gleaned from multiple disparate data streams. And what's the utility of those sources? And where might there be bias? And then user experience design, another area where design can actually promote or hinder equity and, and uh, promote equity or hinder it. And want to think about for the designers in the audience how we can actually design for equity. First, I'd like us to talk, uh, understand a little bit about the numbers and the statistics. I've been working in health equity and community health informatics for uh, a few years now, and there are a lot of numbers and statistics. And these issues, especially this year, are now what I call what's called kitchen table topics. I'm getting questions about health equity from people I never got questions uh, from before, because these are issues that are on the news they're ubiquitous, they're around us. Also, issues of, of racism, structural inequality, and social justice. These, in fact, are connected. And those, of who do, those of us who do work in these areas understand that they've always been linked. I've got a diagram here uh, that depicts population, community, and individual, that all these factors kind of interrelate. And I think what we've been seeing recently in the news is a lot of data around population, populations, large groups of people being affected by, by COVID. Um, some groups affected disproportionately. So we have community, smaller groups of people who might be affected disproportionately. But what I wanted to do in this talk, at least at this point in the talk, is kind of concentrate a bit on the individual. Narratives, stories are powerful and as I have been contemplating and reflecting on the events of the last few months in the context of the work that I do, I think it's important for us to bring forward individuals who might have been affected differently than some of us by these issues. So with that, I would like to invite one of two special guests to, um, I guess, put their camera on, Troy. Thank you, there you are. Hey, Troy. And I'm going to uh, just, um, share a little conversation that Troy and I are going to have um, about how the last few months have impacted him. So Troy and I have known each other, full disclosure, since junior high school. 
we're good friends. That means we mess with each other. We talk about all kinds of issues. And around March, mid-March, when the world really started to change for us, many of us, I remember talking to Troy as he was at work. Troy is a letter carrier. He's a mailman. And of course, I was uh, like many of us. I was freaked out to leave the house. Like I was just wasn't sure what was going on. And I'm talking to him as he's delivering the mail. And it struck me initially then, and it has several times since, that for some of us, our work lives have changed quite a bit. But for others, hasn't changed much at all. So as an essential worker, as somebody that we all depend on, I wanted to at least uh, let him share his thoughts. So Troy, how have the last few months changed your work life? Well, uh, work has pretty much been the same um, as far as going out and delivering the mail every day. Uh, we've had some change as far as interacting with customers. Uh, they don't want us to, to interact with people. So uh, we're not knocking on doors and uh, getting signatures and things of that nature. We have uh, certified letters or um, express mail. They, uh, they're asking us to just leave it. Uh, we sign it, you know, we put the, the customer's initials, we put our initials. Uh, they want us to write COVID-19 on there and then we just leave it. So if the person didn't want the certified letter, they're gonna, uh, either way. Um, you know, they've done some social distancing at work. They've staggered our start time. So some of us come in, um, say at 7.30 and then uh, the second wave comes in at eight. So they're hoping that we kind of uh, get out of there before the next wave come in, or at least if we aren't done yet, where we have a limited amount of time that we're actually in the building together. And they do extra, you know, cleaning. They clean up our cases, you know, every night. Uh, we bring back our keys. They put them in a solution. They wipe down our scanners. Uh, you know, they provide masks and they give us uh, solutions to clean up our, I mean, to wipe down our vehicles every day in the morning when we come in, you know, wipe down, you know, all the surfaces you're touching, steering wheels, knobs, stuff like that, which is something that we had never done previously. So your, your work life has changed uh, a bit as all ours have, but certainly more so than my work life. I get to sit in this room most days and I don't have to be around anybody I don't need to be around. And that's been pretty easy for me to, to distance. Um, in some cases, much more than six feet. Right. Because we have the ability to, some of us have the ability to work remotely. So if you would, Troy, just talk a little bit about how the pandemic has affected your uh, non-work life, your personal life. Um, well, obviously we've had to quarantine, so not getting out and doing things that we would normally do. I, uh, became a grandfather in November. So, uh, obviously like around March is when things had, you know, there was a drastic change and, um, you know, everywhere is quarantining and stuff like that so since i'm working every day uh around that time i decided that um i wouldn't you know go see my grandson because you know we we, we didn't know you know what was going on with the covid and you know with me being out and you know dealing with mail stuff like that every day i just thought it would be a good idea to kind of you know stay away from him for the time being until you know we kind of figured out what was going on but i had to do a lot of facetiming which is kind of difficult to do with the baby because he doesn't know that he's the zero in on you on the camera he's like looking all over the place you know he might catch your face for a second but other than that it's kind of a, a difficult thing to do so i had to do that for a little while so that was that was a little depressing because I was finally feeling like he was getting used to me and, and knowing me. And now, 
you know, I was stuck with, you know, who knows when I'm going to see him again. He's probably not going to even remember me next time that I actually get to hold him because, you know, we've lost the contact and the familiarity. Okay. Well, thank you for, for sharing, Troy. I appreciate you sharing that and, uh, and joining us. And with that, I'd like to um, call up another buddy of mine, Mr. Al, or Dr. Al Johnson. He's a retired Methodist bishop. He also works with the New York Theological Seminary. And uh, Al and I have been been friends, not, not since junior high, but uh, quite <laughs> a few years now. And I wanted uh, Al to just offer his perspectives on how the pandemic has impacted him and his life since, uh, since it's come upon us here. Well, thanks, Charles. It's, uh, it's really my joy to be with Charles anytime. Uh, anybody who knows Charles knows that he's uh, super talented, but never shows it. Kind of like Rudyard Kipling. He knows how to walk with kings, but not lose the common touch. So thanks, Charles, for the work that you're doing with health equity and uh, all of the work you're doing for social justice. Much appreciate that. Um, as, as Charles mentioned, I'm a retired minister, so I immediately think of social justice um, out from a biblical point of view, uh, such as Amos, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like ever flowing stream. And uh, Martin Luther King's favorite, uh, Luke 4, um, come to bring good news, set the captive free, open the eyes of the blind, and set at liberty those who are oppressed. And so social justice for me gets rooted uh, in biblical terms and then lived out in many ways. Uh, Charles is aware of the fact that, uh, that I had a very personal experience with COVID-19, uh, not only personal, but I had it, as well as my son. But what Charles is more aware of is uh, that my wife contracted and um, untimely deceased on March the 27th. Uh, we both became very ill uh, during the week of the uh, 23rd. And our doctor immediately told her to go to the hospital because my wife had sarcoidosis and a considerable amount of her lungs had already been compromised. Uh, I'm, I'm 70, she's 72. And, and had never expected to live as long as she did, but we had a wonderful, joyful 15 year marriage and was just enjoying ourselves in dealing with even compromised health and everything else. Uh, she also was a retired minister. But on the 27th, when we expected her to come home, our son and I, uh, she died in the hospital there itself. And needless to say, I am still recovering, but thankful to God for grace and for friends like Charles, frankly, who kind of keep us afloat and keep us all alive. I wish deeply that our government had alerted us earlier than March. My understanding is our government knew about COVID-19 back in January sometime. And I can only think and had I known that, I would not have taken my wife to a church program with me on March the 8th in Chinatown. And that has nothing to do with China, Chinese. It's just the fact I would not have come to New York knowing how dangerous it might be. I wish that we would have known that. Now, in some ways I could say that the health care she received was very, very good. In fact, it was excellent. What, at some point we were in California, he really got excellent care. And even back in New Jersey, we lived in uh, Matawan, New Jersey. Um, and I, I can tell you that when the ambulance got here and the nurses and people got, they were beautiful with her. I cannot say anything about any kind of racial inequity or anything like that. However, looking at the circles that Charles has on his graph and maybe adding one more, which has to do with history. Uh, her father died from tuberculosis. It is highly suspected 
that he passed on to her sarcoidosis and also um, the health problems, lung disease she had. Um, I have to assume that some aspect of sociology and racism may well have had to do with him having tuberculosis. Now, again, I would never use that as causality, but there's such a high correlation between what has happened with the deaths and illnesses around African Americans and COVID-19. Disproportionate number of Blacks who have died from this outstanding and glaring. And I have to believe in some way, my wife through lineage and history uh, had to be a part of that same. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a, a professor now at a seminary and I can tell you now that three of my graduating seniors, all African-Americans, all contracted COVID-19, including some of the parents, our students, and, and, and family members, which were all, again, predominantly African-American. Uh, social justice and equity and health has everything to do being rooted in structural racism and inequities. And again, Charles, I'm thankful that people like you are researching, bringing proof to bear, and helping us to stay alive. I'm glad to see Brother Troy. We met too at, through uh, Charles, and he shared a little bit about being an essential worker and how he has to put his whole family at risk. He's got to do. That. I have a I have a cousin who's also a post post a postman in Washington D.C. He has to do the same thing. He comes home and he has to either change all of his clothes in a special place. Uh, so the whole issue of equity, social justice, and life is more than a thought, more than a concept, more than a theory. It's a lived experience. And I'm one to be able to tell you about it through the death of my wife. Thanks, Ash. For sharing that, I and and I'm sure our our audience appreciates your heartfelt comments about how this has impacted you and uh, you. I didn't show you these slides prior, but you addressed some of the points that I have coming that we're going to discuss. So, thanks also for including that. There's an axiom that I first ran across in my first epidem epidemiology course, that you must count everyone in order for everyone to count. And it means a lot to me and other folks who work in this space. And with Troy and Al's personal accounts, I think we should all keep in mind that there are people behind these numbers. There are families behind these statistics. And yes, it's important to, to count and to, um, analyze data at the population community level and the individual level for that matter. But behind these numbers are individual stories and families who are impacted and continue to be impacted by some of what we see in, in the news and what we see all around us. So a common understanding about health equity, Healthy People 2020, which is a CDC uh, initiative. It actually started as Healthy People 2000 in 1990. It defines health, health equity as the attainment of the highest level of health for all people. Achieving health equity requires valuing everyone equally with focused and ongoing societal efforts to address avoidable inequalities, historical and contemporary injustices, the elimination of health and health care disparities. Al mentioned Dr. King. This is one of my favorite quotes from Dr. King, there are many, and one I use in my work. It helps also guide my work. This is in fact a social justice issue. Dr. King said in March 1966, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. So this question about uh, this issue around health equity and social justice is not new. It's been around us for quite some time, and it's certainly not just Dr. King who has spoken to these issues. This is in the WHO, the World Health Organization Constitution, the highest attainable standard of health as a fundamental right of every human being. It's in the Constitution for the World Health Organization. That's from 1946. So these issues are not, not new. They're still around. 
we're chipping away at them. But there are factors, as Al alluded, structural factors that enable them. And I'll talk about that in a moment. So there's been decades of health equity research, literally decades, that has resulted in sophisticated management tools and identification of drivers. There are different uh, tools online where we can go and look. I'm not going to do that here in the time that we have. But actually, where you live influences how long you live. So just living in certain areas impacts how long you can be expected to live. And there's an expression out there that says that your zip code matters more than your genetic code. And there's, in fact, empirical data to bear that out. And there are tools out there where you can enter your or a zip code and see in fairly close geographic proximity how people from certain areas are expected to live longer or shorter than people in others. You can actually map life expectancy by uh, neighborhood. And there are there are sources here and, and links to actually do that online if you're so moved. So health equity is a social justice issue primarily because social determinants of health, that's a term I hear much more now than I did say last year, um, they influence health outcomes. So one of the things that I've learned early in my journey in healthcare and health research, I had a health behavior course that was taught by a psychologist. And he said in class that our behavior is a function of our options. And that kind of stuck with me. I'll say it again. Our behavior is a function of our option. And if we think about times where we've been stressed or we didn't pack a lunch that day, what do our food choices look like when our options are constrained? Well, there are people who live in environments where that's a constant. And these social determinants, I just use one example, drive persistent inequity. The five of them, economic stability, employment, food insecurity, housing instability, poverty, education, early childhood education and development, enrollment in higher education, High school graduation, language and literacy are all encompassed in the second determinant, education. Social and community context, things like civic participation, discrimination, incarcer incarceration rates, and social cohesion or social capital are comprised in social and community context. Then, of course, health and health care, access to health care, not just having an insurance card in your wallet or in your pocket, but access to continuous care or continuity of care, primary care, as well as um, specialty care. And then the last social determinant, fifth one, is neighborhood and built environment, access to healthy foods that support healthy eating patterns, crime and violence, environmental conditions, quality of housing. So those are five social determinants that have been established for quite some time now that drive persistent inequity. Our privilege can blind us to these factors. The thing about privilege is that it's awfully sneaky. We don't notice it when it's at work and it's making our lives a little bit easier. But when it's taken away, we notice right away when our privilege due to education or economics especially is somehow threatened. Think of a time or recall a time when any of these factors were threatened for you or your family and how they may have exerted a negative influence on you. When maybe your financial situation was not one that was sufficient to support you when you were sick. Or maybe when you lived in an environment where the your health was threatened literally by the environment that you're in. Important point is that these determinants don't just happen. They're not like gravity, some kind of natural law that just sort of occurs. These drivers of health inequity specifically, these five drivers, structural discrimination, income inequality, disparities in opportunity, disparities in political power, governance that limits meaningful participation. 
These drivers are the result of institutions that create and sustain them. These institutions are populated by individuals who either actively make decisions to maintain inequity or passively maintain inequity by simply looking the other way, by not caring quite enough for, if I may, Al, the least of these, back to Matthew 25. Based on the size of this alumni group and that it is an alumni group, I suspect that some of these institutional leaders might be in attendance today. These leaders are what I call the grown-ups in organizations. They're the ones who do, to direct and make decisions on time, money, and human capital. They determine where resources go in organizations. And I would submit that either actively or passively, they actually help to create some of these sustained conditions. When I first started studying health equity around really in essence the mid 2000s. Like many, I thought the healthcare system was broken. We've seen the data, probably many of us, about how the US spends a certain amount on healthcare, spends the most of any developed nation, yet is about in the middle of developed nations in terms of outcomes. But I would suggest that maybe it isn't broken. Maybe it's like the criminal justice system. Deanna Hoskins who is a senior policy advisor for the Department of Justice, noted, and from what I could find first time noted, that the criminal justice system is not, in fact, broken. It's, a, it's a operating just as designed, that it's not broken at all, that it's operating as it's intended to. Evidence, well, the cost of imprisonment and jail in the past 20 years has grown faster for each state than any other budget item. So if we think about where we allocate our resources and when we allocate our resources, that's a pretty good indication of where our priorities are or aren't. It costs about $80 a day to house an inmate, and then the United States spends in excess of $68 billion a year on corrections. There's a wonderful book, if some of you aren't aware, called The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Color Blindness by Michelle Alexander. It's excellent. It's, come out, it's been out a few years now. That speaks more directly to these issues. My points in bringing this up is that perhaps the healthcare system, much like the criminal justice system, is not in fact broken, but it is performing the way it's designed to. I want to talk a bit about structural inequities and how we perceive them. I think I'll mention that structural inequities, what are they? Common understanding, systematic disadvantage of one social group compared to other groups with whom they coexist that are deeply embedded in the fabric of society. A bit of history here. I'm multidisciplinary, so I'm going to talk a little bit about history briefly. Um, let's, uh, there's this notion of that there's a past and present America, a narrative that this past and present America, I'm sorry for advancing there, this is the slide I want, that the narrative draws a distinction between the past, pre 1950s, and the present, post 1950s. The past, the removal of Native Americans, slavery, women's suffrage, Jim Crow internment of Japanese Americans, criminalization of homosexual acts. White women, people of color living with disabilities suffer discrimination and social exclusion. Then the present, so post 1950s, progress towards diversity, equity, and inclusion due to policy changes, Civil Rights Act, Voting Rights Act, Title IX, Americans with Disabilities Act, and of course the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act and also the Supreme Court legalizing marriages. So there's this notion of this past and present America, this narrative. Well, this narrative suggests two Americas because only one believed that segregation and discrimination are in fact the past. Let's look at some data, and this is pre-2020 data. 81% of whites, 71% of all respondents indicated in a nationally representative poll that blacks have a good chance, as good a chance as white people in your community to get any kind of job for which they are qualified. 36% of whites compared to 70% of blacks believe that racial discrimination is a major reason that blacks have a harder time getting ahead than whites. It's quite a chasm. That's 2016. And then for those that uh, responded to a national representative poll in 2015, 43% of whites compared to 66% of blacks 
64% of Hispanics say that racism is a big problem. This was pre-2020. So I wonder, how might COVID inequity and the killing of George Floyd influence these perceptions? I'm glad you asked. We've got data. So this preliminary data, this is from 538, uh, August 19th, relatively current, suggests that we're returning to pre-Floyd killing levels. First of all, cable news coverage of protests have plummeted since May 25th. We see the clips, this the, uh, the y-axis here is number of clips, and we see a spike to be expected just after the Floyd killing, and then we see this dip, this trend line going down. Well, correlation is not causality, as Al indicated. But let's think about perceptions here. Again, a 538 poll, same from August 19th, indicates that the respondents who believe that Black Americans face a lot or a great deal of discrimination by race. We see Black here, almost back to pre-Floyd. And then this line is all, and then the line beneath is white, all respondents and then white respondents. So the message here for me is that the levels are, after a spike, a relatively short spike, are returning to levels from January. And of course, the chasm between black and white, black and all. So the perceptions are different. For a moment here, I'll provide some of the data, the COVID data that, that Al had alluded to. So there's stark evidence during 2020, which counters these perceptions that discrimination might not be at play as, uh, as much as it was during the Floyd time. One particular COVID inequity that stands out, at least for me, this data is from June 14th. Black Americans are far more likely to know someone who has died of the co coronavirus than other races. So this is from June. It's not the most current uh, data. It's, the, it's, uh, it's widely cited, this, this particular Washington Post poll, that 31% of Black Americans, again, as of mid-June, know someone who has died from the coronavirus. The overall for adults is 13%. Hispanic Americans, 17%, white Americans, 9%. So the, the notion of this touching us personally actually is stratified a bit by race and that we may be having different experiences with this particular issue. I wanna talk just for a minute about health information technology. As I, as I mentioned in the introduction, HIT can promote or hinder health equity, challenges. One of the key challenges is what we call in, in, in health informatics, informen, informen, intervention generated inequality, easy for me to say, or IGI. What is that? That occurs when technology is characterized by inequity. For example, access to broadband or sociocultural barriers like mistrust and beliefs and perceptions so that a technology mediated information exchange. That's a fancy way of saying, hey, let's create this nice cool app so people can enter in their vitals. Well, that's influenced by sociocultural factors. It's influenced by access, in my example, not so much to broadband, but maybe to Wi Fi. I want to talk briefly about machine learning. Machine learning is wonderful. It's used to identify, among other things, identify gene expression to predict cancer outcomes. This is an example of inching closer to the promise of personalized medicine by determining the optimal treatment regimen based on your genetic profile. However, this area is also subject to negative effects of persistent biases. Well, 
there's human bias. There's known bias in clinical encounters. I am doing some work with prostate cancer, and the specific area is prostate cancer treatment selection. Well, the data shows that physicians respond differently to black patients with prostate cancer than they do non-black patients with prostate cancer. There's also algorithmic bias due to, under, due to several factors, primarily underrepresentation of ethnic minority populations in clinical research. One piece of data indicates that blacks are less than 5% of participants in studies that produced 24 of the 31 FDA approved cancer drugs over the fat fat past five years. So if you don't have a representative sample in your clinical trials, how can your treatment be representative? The good news quickly here is that there are ways to mitigate some of these factors. One of the opportunities is with community-based participatory research. Well, what's that? Community-based participatory research enables us to engage with communities of interest. So if we want to work with a specific community, say a Latinx community in New Brunswick, we can engage, we researchers can engage with members of that community to help shape the research projects that we conduct from the beginning, including with the, the research questions that we might want to uh, answer. And there are models, uh, again, like health equity work, CBPR models have been around for decades, about two decades, two plus decades now. And these, I'm not gonna take us through the details here, but there are conceptual models for how to do this work, but it's not always executed appropriately. Combining CBPR with other, perhaps more uh, familiar uh, concepts for the designers in the audience, user-centered design or participatory design combined with CBPR. The point is that you're engaging with communities to help uh, to, to, have, to hear their voice in or invite their voice into designing projects, conducting projects, analyzing data, and actually dissemination of results. So the full process of research that's engaged with communities, this approach can help mitigate some of the disconnects. There's a, uh, a graphic here that I, that I enjoy, I, I refer to quite often. Nothing about us without us is for us. This actually has its roots in the uh, disability rights advocacy movement uh, in South Africa in the 1980s. And it's, that concept is a very powerful one. So why does health equity matter as we round up, as we uh, wrap up here? Why does it matter? Seriously, does it really matter? I want us to not assume that this is something that matters. Refer back or, or think back, reflect on the criminal justice data. The cost of inequity, there is a financial cost of inequity. In the United States, 17% of the GDP gross domestic product or about $9,000 per person per year is what we spend. Other developed countries across Europe and Asia spend about you know, half of that. So we do spend more, and this, this is 2016 data. About one third, 31% of healthcare costs for ethnic minorities due to health, are due to health inequalities. So about a third of all costs for ethnic minorities can be directly traced to inequalities. Eliminating racial disparities can reduce uh, costs of care by up to $230 billion. Also, the US is the only developed country to spend more on healthcare than it does on social services. So what we're doing really is we're not funding social services and we're just funding healthcare. So the work that could be done, the good work that could be done by social services is done, not all in the emergency room, but given the work, some of the work that I do, instead of going to a mental health counselor, perhaps the person shows up in the ER. So why does it matter? We've got financial costs, we have human costs. We heard about that today. There is broad data around just life expectancy. There's irrefutable evidence that inequality contributes to inefficiency in our system from a human and a financial standpoint. And what we have here is that African-Americans 
life expectancy 74.6 years, Asian American 86.5. We have about a 12 year gap. What causes that gap? Well, heart disease, cancer, homicide, diabetes, mental health conditions. It's not all, uh, there are also areas where whites are experiencing equitable outcomes as well. Whites are twice as likely to die from suicide than blacks, that's 2017 data. I'll just throw this out. Perhaps what matters more than equity, though, is that some people actually don't have enough. So there's equity, and then there is people who are at the bottom, quote unquote. So we're in the third month, just to wrap up, we're in the third month of this racial reconciliation. What can we do with this moment? And how long will this moment last? That's a question I'd like for us to perhaps discuss. There are things we can do to reduce structural discrimination, though. We can, we can educate ourselves on historical and contemporary oppression, segregation, bias. So think about that as we go forth in our work beyond this discussion, which I'm really looking forward to. And these drivers help segment this broad area of that is health inequity. I'm going to put this framework up to show this integration of factors of structural inequalities and bias. I'm not sure, hopefully you can see that. Education, transportation, social environment, public safety, physical environment, income and wealth, housing, health system and services, employment. These are social determinants that all play a role that exert influence on our health outcomes. So with that, I will wrap up and uh, welcome your questions. I will throw it to Elizabeth. Remember, both Al and Troy are still with us, so if you have questions for them, certainly they're here and they are ready and willing to answer them as well. Great. Thank you, Charles and Al and Troy for your comments and sharing your stories. Um, I'd like to open it up, Charles, if I can. Um, and maybe this is to all of you, um, Al and Troy, too. How has the COVID pandemic and the George Floyd murders um, influenced you and your work? Um, I know you've been at this work for a very long time and it contributed to the literature. I'm curious how the confluence of those things um, have changed for you and where you're pointing your star now. Was that for you? Yeah, I think you can start. I'm, I'm happy to punt it over to Al um, or Troy, too. Well, uh, to be brief here, I, I would just say that, that having this discussion, talking explicitly about structural inequity and racism is not something that I necessarily did in, in my talks and in my work um, and communicating results of my work. It was something that there was uh, actually, frankly, quite a bit of resistance to around tying a diabetes disparate outcome to racism. There are pathways that connect those dots, but I'll speak for me, uh, this, this ra racial reconciliation moment, my re reconciliation moment, which is my term, I, I am using those terms quite intentionally more so now in my, in my work and in my talk about my work as evidenced by this talk here. So I think that the awareness of structural inequality has helped illuminate that these issues do exist and have existed. And that offers an entree, at least for me, to connect the work that I do to contemporary events that are all around us. Great. Thank you, Al. I think you're trying to say something. I'll ask if you can, if we can help you get on off mute. Okay. I think I got all that. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Al. So, uh, I I teach right now at New York Theological Seminary in New York City, and I particularly teach a course called uh, Urban Leadership Seminar. And throughout the um, seminar, often bring in guest speakers like. Uh, Charles to um, give a lecture about leadership. Um, invariably, uh, this year in particular, uh, the pandemic will be the major topic um, in pulpits across America, particularly in black churches, but also in white churches. 
uh, the pandemic is, is, is serious. And the key thing is it's the two pandemics. They, they are inseparable, inextricably bound. And uh, speaking out of that has both positive and negative effects. There are some people who simply say, well, uh, how would God allow something like this to happen? And training and teaching young ministers in theology um, how to respond. Um, usually we dig back into history and talk about how it's happened before and how we've been able to come through. But uh, this is the present. And um, needing to put that in terms for today has made a difference. And so it does. It has made a tremendous difference in our teaching, uh, in our thinking, and in our training uh, in so many different ways. And especially, as Charles has said so nicely, the convergence. It has never been clearer before, ever, that I can remember uh, in my years of history, even though I'm only 70 years young. I pass the baton to Troy. Thank you. Well, for me, I just think uh, both of these uh, two things coming together right now has made for an interesting uh, experience at work. Um, I think the stress of, of all the racial stuff, go well, first it was, um, I can't even remember which came first now. Uh, hmm. The pandemic was first, so yeah. Uh, just the, the uncertainty and the stress and the, you know, life being changed around dealing with that. And, and then the George Floyd incident coming after that, I've, uh, you know, found myself to be a little irritable, uh, at work. So maybe it's, it's probably good that, you know, everybody isn't together because I've, I've had, a. uh, a few things with with coworkers where they they thought I was was upset with them and angry and you know I was just no I'm, I'm just trying to explain you know my experiences and where I'm coming from and it gets a little frustrating to have people you know tell me that my own life experiences are being determined by you know the media or you know something I've seen on the news or read somewhere and um so that's been a little stressful, but we, I just had to let people know that I, I, the ones that I do really care about and are friends with that, um, I'm taking the time to talk to you about these things and work it out. So hopefully it'll, it'll be better for everyone, but it has been a little bit stressful with, with both of these things happening at the same time. Thank you for that, Troy. Um, I'm going to switch gears. We've gotten a few questions in the chat. Um, Charles, this is about the use of technology and, and how we can design things um, that are equitable. So are there good examples of where technology was designed, understanding the history? And I loved, Al, what you said before, another bubble about history. So it's population all the way down to the individual wrapped it in with the history too. So um, Charles, some folks are asking about specific things that designers of technology can do. Um, they will understand the history, but the question is, are there good examples and how do you approach that type of work? Well, thanks for that question. It is a it is an important one. And as technology continues to develop, becomes more ubiquitous. I have found that co-design or user-centered design or participatory design, as I mentioned in a previous slide, can at least uh, abate some of that risk. So that if you're designing a system broadly with users, with the people who are actually, uh, that, that you're targeting or that may be using that technology, they can point things out like that, oh um, yes, I carry a smartphone, but I don't use it for that or I might not have a data plan that enables me to sort of uh, download an unlimited amount of data, say for a month for a period. So those kinds of insights might seem innocuous or, or 
they might seem obvious, but as you're in the midst of designing solutions, and I'm not going to call anyone out here, but there are examples where you forget or, or it's forgotten on a team that the person who's actually using it, if you're designing for an underserved community or if you're just designing for a community in general, if you're not thinking about equity across the, the spectrum of potential users, then as I mentioned, IGI or intervention generation, uh, intervention generated inequalities can, can emerge. So I would submit there's no one sort of utopian answer for that, but I will say that community-based participatory research or participatory design, user-centered design, and these concepts have been around for a long time, these approaches, can at least abate some of that risk. Great, thank you for that. Um, I know we're coming up on our time and I wanna respect all of the panelists here for giving so generously today. Um, but here's one last question. If there was, if the president asked you to fix something about healthcare in the United States, what would you do? What would you ask? What would you share? Is that from you? I think it's, I'd like to hear from all, everyone if that's okay, but you can go first, Charles. Can I clarify the question? Yes. Which president? I have a very, I have a very quick answer. Oh, good. If you like. Yeah, he could resign. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I asked which president. Um, let's just say that uh, a president asked. I, I think that what, what screams out to me, it's not a, a panacea for all of our, our issues, but I think a lot of the issues with the healthcare system in general are with a lack of a single payer, uh, that every other developed nation in the world has a single payer, some form of a single payer system. I, I hear that that conversation emerging recently um, as it did briefly in 2008 when the Affordable Care Act was being discussed. And I, I just don't know of a, uh, a better way to ensure large, a large group of heterogeneous people. Troy, I'm, uh, I'm happy to entertain. <laughs> I'll leave that to Charles. He's the professional on that topic. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, I thought what you said before, Charles, and, and it was echoed throughout the conversation that nothing with without us, um, that your slide was really well done. And so I think that some of the questions um, that come up, it's about um, nothing for us, nothing about us without us is for us. And so I think that um, representation matters, um, but I do want to ask if there's any last remaining questions and I'll turn it over to Stephanie if she wants to close. Um, but I wanna honor and respect um, Dr. Johnson for uh, your grief um, and honor that and the commitment that you've made to sharing your story. And to you, Troy, I hope that you're reunited with your grandson soon. Um, he will not forget you and happily children are quite resilient. So he'll know that voice of yours. Um, and thank you, Charles, of course, as always, for bringing us all together um, as part of the Rutgers community. Stephanie, I'll turn well. it over to you. Thank you, Elizabeth, too, for moderating us so wonderfully. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to, I, I can't really end it on a better note than that. So I just, I want to thank Dr. Johnson and Troy for being here, for sharing your time and your stories with us. And Charles, good luck at MIT. Please pass on that Scarlet Pride, bring it with you. And Elizabeth, congratulations on your final presentation. And I love your R. <laughs> congratulations on your final presentation and good luck at graduation in October. And on behalf of the Rutgers University Alumni Association, I want to thank all of you for being here, for all of our attendees for being here, and I hope everybody has a great night and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.